Good evening and welcome to the September 19th, 2016 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please call the roll? Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Ms. Ogla? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Mr. McGee? Here. Thank you. Um, so a few quick housekeeping notes before we move into our um, agenda here. The first is that we have two items on, their, on our agenda that have been tabled at the request of the applicant. Um, Commercial Place LLC, which is item number five on your agenda, has been tabled, as well as item number eight, John and Stephanie Hadded, Windward Heights. Um, also, at the request of Dunstan Properties LLC, uh, which is item number four, we'll be taking that one last out of our um, active agenda of uh, applicants for this evening um, due to uh, availability issues there. So um, the upshot there is that <laughs> item number six, Crest Motel LLC, will be our first item <laughs> when we get to that. But even before that, I've got a couple more, which is are that um, uh, the absences that we have, um, both Ms. Oglis and Mr. Bealey will be voting members this evening. Ms. Saunders and Mr. Bealey. Right, Ms. Saunders and Mr. Bealey. Right. Thank you. Welcome. Almost had it. Close. <laughs> Thank you. On the right side of the mm -hmm. Um Next item is approval of minutes from the August 29th, 2016 meeting. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, to be unanimous. Thank you. So again, moving down the agenda, uh, next item will be item number six. Crest Motel LLC requests a preliminary subdivision review for 11 Willowdale Road, Assessor's Map, U39, Lot 41. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Um, board members may recall I've seen this application, or at least parts of this application, two previous times. Once was when it was before you for a zoning amendment which occurred uh, I think back in the springtime. It went from a commercial zone to an abutting R4 district. Um, and so they are now before the board with their formal subdivision application. Um, ostensibly what they're looking to do is construct two uh, duplex buildings on an existing structure, that current, or I'm sorry, an existing lot that has currently uh, an existing dwelling on it. Um, the reason it triggers subdivision review, even though typically we deal with subdivisions uh, more typically when, when it's a lot division, it's this uh, when you trigger or when there's the creation of three or more dwelling units <coughs> in a five year period, it triggers subdivision review. Um, and so that's why this is before the board. Um, in addition to being in the R4, this property is also um, has the shoreland uh, zoning overlay district as well as stream protection district on it. Um, so those are items for the board to consider. And sort of in reviewing the subdivision uh, um, items, staff provided some comments for your consideration. I think uh, the predominant issues were raised in our town engineer water and currents memo. So I'll ask Angela if she has um, some some items to overview for the board before you begin your deliberation. All right. Thanks, Jay. Um, thank you. Um, there were just two items I think that will probably be addressed tonight. I did talk with um, Steve Blake, who actually did the stormwater designer um, yes. late this afternoon. Yep. Um, two things that are in the memo that um, I would highlight from Wooder and Kearns that I, I, I tried to highlight in mine was, um, for one thing, the increase of peak flow rate that they're requesting off the site. Um, it, at this point is insignificant is what was referred to in Witter and Kern's memo, but there was also some um, modifications to the model that needed to happen, so we're not quite sure what that number will be that we're actually asking for, um, for a waiver request for that increase. And then the other item was um, typically we look for LID measures 
on sites, even smaller sites like this. Um, the board has um, looked at with Comfort Keepers and Main Eye, other smaller sites like this to look at what is potential on the sites. And I know talking with Steve today, he had some ideas. Um, so I'd be anxious to hear what, <coughs> what you might have to add to that. Um, one of the things I just wanted to point out that's in my memo as well is that this um, stream that runs behind is Willowdale, which is on the DEP's threatened streams list for priority list. And so that is one of the things I just wanted to highlight. Thank you. And if I could just add one other item I forgot to mention is uh, Bill Bray did do a traffic peer review, so you should also have a memo from him. And his, uh, I think the main issue or uh, item that was raised in his had to do with ensuring adequate sight lines um, up the road. So <coughs> okay. with that, turn it back. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you. Uh, my name is Walter Pelkey, and I uh, represent BH2M and Paul Russo of Crest Motel, LLC. Uh, as Jay said, uh, we are looking for a uh, five-unit residential project, um, and the site had previously been approved as a commercial site, rezoned to R4, and we presented it this way. Uh, generally speaking, we have tried to maintain um, our entrance. We're, we're holding the existing entrance that exists, and the entrance that had been initially approved uh, back in 2010 or 11. Uh, utilities, again, try to maintain as close to that concept as before with input from the sewer district and the Portland Water District. Uh, we meet with the sewer district on Thursday to button up what details we have with those, but we have had some uh, input with them already. Uh, as Angela said, we received our peer review uh, comments and uh, staff comments. I address most of those today aside from, <coughs> excuse me, aside from uh, redoing the um, uh, stormwater notes, which is a pretty large undertaking, uh, but that we will get done. But most of the stuff there was pretty basic. Now, to Angela's points, um, the stormwater report will be adjusted and taking into account the comments from Pierre. But now we're considering a, a vegetated soil filter in the area where the uh, level spreader is on your plan as part of the, the low impact development measures. And with that, w we hope uh, we'll meet your standard as well as touching up those uh, numbers on the stormwater plan should address those issues. Anything else? Uh, okay. No, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, before we go to board discussion, we have the opportunity for public comment on this item. So if anyone has anything to say, come on up and introduce yourself. Seeing none, we'll go to the board. And um, Robin, would you like to start? Sure. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so are you relying on the wooded buffer at all to provide any stormwater treatment or attenuation? Uh, technically, no. but. I don't believe there are any plans to, to cut that uh, based on the soil type there and the slopes. Uh, I guess by the book, uh, it doesn't really meet the standard. I think we'd be looking for something in the area of, of uh, 100 or 120 feet. We only have about 75. Okay. Now, it will help, but um, it's nothing that factors into the, the low impact. It, it doesn't meet the standard. Yeah. Um. <coughs> What other natural areas are you planning to retain or, you know, in, in, in with respect to? I know it's a very tight em de developable envelope. Mm -hmm. Once you bring in all the um, setbacks from the stream and the <coughs> are there any other natural areas that you're planning to maintain um, for stormwater management? Uh, no, just okay. if, if you look at the, um, on, on your plan, the plan and profile sheet, I believe it's sheet three. Mm -hmm. where that um, level spreader is will be where we'll put that vegetated soil filter. Excellent. <coughs> okay. Um, so I, I would also echo sort of what I, I, would, I would want to um, reserve approval based on the revised analysis that's, that's forthcoming um, on the um, flow rates an attenuation there, but I do have questions on whether or not you've considered um, 
staff comments regarding the low impact development measures, if any of those will be incorporated into the design at all? Y yes, it will. The, the vegetated soil felt that we're proposing now will meet that standard. Okay. But none of the sort of like roof drip edges or anything like that? No, we, we, we looked at, um, I know the three things that Angela had suggested. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the, of the roof drip edge mm -hmm. just because of where it puts the water and, and mm -hmm. that's from more of a basement waterproofing thing, my own sort of theory. Yep. Um, we looked at um, the underdrain ditch, uh, but the ditch um, on the, I guess it would be the northerly side, a little, just a tick too steep probably for okay. that. So the vegetated soil filter seems to uh, meet the criteria for what we're looking for the area we have to put it. Yeah, and, f and forgive me, we have so many projects that we have to review. Yep. Remind me where you are with the sanitary district approval? Thursday night we Thursday meet with night. them, yeah. Okay. And um, I think that's all I have, but Mr. Chair, I would, <clears throat> I would, um, I don't feel like we have um, enough information to approve the, the waiver being requested as far as, um, it basically number two on the town engineer's memo. Okay. Thank you. Roger? Um, it sounds to me like there's quite a few, oh, there's a number of issues that are still in flux and and uh, <coughs> still being worked out by staff and, and you people. It seemed minor to me in, in, in the realm of revisions that I had today to take care of, aside from just getting that vegetated soil filter in place. Okay. Um, uh, Roger, just to, if you'll allow me just for, for a second, I'd just like to remind folks that if, if we act on this item at all this evening, it will just be for preliminary subdivision approval, so we're not talking about mm -hmm. site plan approval. Okay. So it's not, not obviously not the same threshold um, as site plan in terms okay. of having all the loose ends buttoned up. Um, I basically don't have any other questions that I'll say. Okay, thank you. Susan? <coughs> when you, <coughs> excuse me, introduced this to us this evening, did you say something about you answered a lot of questions today? <coughs> uh, we spoke with Angela today to get squared away yes. on the low impact development. The rest of the questions okay, is just what was things. in staff Anything review. else that is outstanding has not been, this, that was just it. Was the, That's it. Okay. Um, we are all set, are we, with the um, net residential calculations? Yes, I had a chance to review that and they Everything appear to fine. have okay. calculated what needs to be. All right. Um, the we, oh, I guess let me get this paper. Um, the wetland delineation. Where am I? <coughs> the date when the edge of the stream was last located and verified should be provided. Is that, is that, the t I'm looking at the um, preliminary subdivision staff comments that we received dated 829. I guess I don't know if, if Bill had touched base with Jay. <coughs> Did, did he get back with you with a date on that? I know that it was kicked around a little bit, right, when we were doing those density calcs for you? Um, I don't remember the date, but I do know it. I can't remember the date offhand, but exceeded the sort of standard five-year right. expectation. Um, so the date of the edge of the, when the edge of the stream was last located and verified has been provided. That was my question. <laughs> it's on your comments. So I guess the the question is, it, it's been it's been in excess of five years, and typically the standard is for uh, a wetland delineation. Five years is sort of the standard um, uh, timeline. Um, and the question that I had in reviewing this was, given how close in proximity mm -hmm. one of the buildings is to that stream setback, is to just verify the edge of that stream. Um, because there is, I think it was already noted, there's quite a bit of grade change down to the wetlands proper, and that, you know, they're not impacting any wetlands per se, you know. And no, that was, so, my, so, that was so, my question. So yeah. really, <coughs> the, the thrust of where staff's comments were coming from was just really around ensuring that the setback being shown <coughs> on the subdivision plan is what's actually in the right. field. It probably sure was. <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that the proposed building does not encroach into the 75-foot setback. Right. Makes sense to me. That's not a problem, okay? Um, the plan needs to be updated to reflect the st stream protection district. Right, and we, we've, we've shown done. that. Uh, we've shown that here. Okay. 
I think it's just ensuring it's, that it's there. labeled. I think they show a 75 foot setback, but just to label it stream protection district. Right. Um, we we, maybe we actually took the stream protection line off your okay. uh, zoning map yep. today. So. And then the um, site distance, as Mr. <coughs> as Bill Bray, multiple large, um, heavily limbed spruce trees to the right. Is that right? Been that we've added a note to the plan to we clean those up. Yep. Okay. Um, people tell you that with computers you don't need paper anymore. Bah humbug, I say. I don't think I have any other questions. I am um, in limbo about the um, um, waiver, but we don't have to make that decision this evening. Right. I mean, we could give preliminary approval with the waiver not being addressed. Um, the board could consider a condition approval. Uh, I'm sorry, preliminary approval with a condition that remaining staff comments be addressed. Um, or okay, so I would appreciate with, that because with that's, waiver consideration. that's a really, you know, yeah. to me that's a really big deal. Yeah. Okay. So I guess that takes care of it for now. With the, I may want to come back. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot else to add uh, to the line of questioning. So uh, I think I'd probably be more in favor of a um, conditional approval rather than an outright waiver on this until uh, the applicant has time to sit with staff and sort out some of the finer details. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I'm generally on, on the same wavelength on this. Um, glad to hear that you're... Um, going forward with the, the low impact design measure. Um, <coughs> it sounds like you're in the process of kind of cleaning some things up and, and with the plans and labeling and so forth. Um, we've got sanitary coming up. Um, we need to clarify that um, delineation of the wetlands um, and just all the, all the other things that are, that are out there in terms of coordinating with staff and Moving on to the next uh, to the next step. So, um, without belaboring it anymore, I guess I will put um, a conditional approval motion forward for uh, move that we that the board grant uh, preliminary subdivision approval uh, to Crest Motel LLC for 11 Willowdale Road, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 41, with the following condition uh, that the applicant work to address work with staff to address staff comments um, in relation to uh, the requested waiver. Does that work? Mm -hmm. All right. That is the motion. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. It's unanimous. Good luck. On the next item we will discuss is item number seven, 137 U.S. Route 1, Scarborough Realty <laughs> LLC, Prime Mercedes-Benz, requests site plan amendment review for 137 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U47, Lot 94. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as board members are likely to remember, this application received uh, conditional approval in June, late June of this year. As part of that approval, the board had five conditions that uh, needed to be met, and really there's two of them which the board is back before you to address. One, uh, the principal item, or two of the principal items. Um, the first condition is around the architectural details. The board had previously uh, requested and sought that the architectural detailing treatment around the car wash sort of coordinate with the um, with the detailing around really the sort of the apron and corner treatment of the uh, remainder of the building. Um, that was a condition of the pr that the board found um, to meet the design standards. And then the other issue was that the board issued a condition of approval that the applicant actually come back before this board with the revised landscaping for review and approval. Um, and then there's a couple others that we can certainly touch on, um, but the other ones, one was um, uh, 
delegated authority to staff to finalize some stormwater details and treatment of roof drains and those type of things. We do have some remaining questions, but nothing we can't work through, but certainly if board members have comments on that, we can work through that. Another condition had to do with a pre-construction meeting. We can deal with that as things move along. And then finally, there was a condition about sanitary district approval, and that has been received, and we have a copy of that. So really, I think the board, um, the principal issues for the board to take a look at are the architectural questions and landscaping. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jay. And I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is David Richards. I'm an architect with Gallon Turgeon Architects. I'm here with Kevin Downing, who is a designer on our, in our landscape architecture department. Uh, I will present on condition one, Kevin will present on condition two, the landscape. Um, I think the, the main reason we're here is to kind of try to figure out the value to the town, to the aesthetic of continuing that band all the way around. Now, we've requested, and I think we're asking your permission to go forward with this. We've also have a board. <laughs> that shows. Would you mind grabbing the uh, wireless mic there, just so we? Thank you. I think it's on. It should already be on. Okay. This board here shows the um, corners and the base as requested. The other board showed it without. Now, one of the things that we see is that. There are very few vantages that we can actually see the base. Now, believe me, I drive high here every day at 35 miles an hour. If you can see the base on this end of the building, you, that may be dangerous. But the reason we're asking for the consideration is because this is the best material for this. We can add the masonry. The masonry needs to be two inches away from the building, and it needs to be properly flashed. All of these things we can do. We're just asking that we don't have to do it because we don't believe it is that visible and it is architecturally not a very sound practice with what we're trying to achieve here with the car wash. And that's about it. Okay. All right, I, I would like to suggest that we do take these in, in sequence since they're take one and then take, take, one the, and then take the next one, uh, okay. since they're they're very uh, distinct. So this time we can turn to board discussion around condition number one, if, if everyone agrees. Um, <coughs> just for the record, we do have the opportunity for any public comment, if there is anyone out there before we go to board discussion. I don't see anyone, so we'll go right to the board. Um, Nick, would you like to start us this time? Is there a, um, a closer view of this? Um, is, there, is there detail, uh, a better example of the detail that I can review real quick? Because you're talking about the corner base. Uh, we're talking about the masonry on this, not the landscaping, correct? Right, yeah. So it, it's difficult for me to sure. see the picturing yeah, from, from the board to you? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. I apparently need some glasses. And if, what if I'm not what mistaken, we're requesting what, right. we're requesting what the town has requested. Right. So this is what we we would like to see, it, yeah. and that is what you're proposing. Okay, now I, thank you. You can just maybe walk it down. Thank you. Can you um, point to what the what's exists or what's proposed and what uh, yeah. what we're requesting uh -huh. and uh, what the town has requested. And then we're willing to do this. It's just it's just it's a big practice. And that, that's an example of the material that would be on the exterior of the car wash, correct, by your, by the podium? Which is, um, which is almost identical to the vertical siding here. They're both old inch exposure. They both have about the same amount of gloss. One is a polycarbonate, 
filled with concrete. That's the car wash material. The other is metal siding, both vertical, both eight inch exposure, both satin and finish. And so, and um, it would be white, but this is the material. I can, see, I can, I certainly understand the um, the desire for some uniformity within the building. Um, however, I, I personally, and and this is where it, we're talking aesthetics. This, this is what it really boils down to, and everyone's going to have an opinion. So for for me, um, I would, I would likely err on the side of the applicant's request here where I don't believe that the difference between what is existing and what is proposed is so aesthetically uh, displeasing that I would say no. So that is my personal thoughts on the matter. <coughs> For that, thank okay. you. Thank you. Susan? I'm on the other side, surprise. Um, I go by there more often than you do. And if we had... That was inappropriate, I apologize. If you um, had the kind of landscaping that I would have you have, which is not in my purvey to request, then I would not be able to see that. But I can see it very clearly as I come up Route 1 heading north, not from the front, but from Route 1 as I'm entering towards your building. It's a little more difficult now that you have those great big white panel trucks there. But should the panel trucks get removed for any reason, like maybe they get sold, then I'm going to see very clearly what's there. It really isn't even quite so much the visual, although I'm a big fan of um, good, high-end quality architecture. This is a quality piece of material, a quality piece of work, and I don't know why now, when we're at the tail end, we have to cut corners. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I also think that when we talk about how we work here in Scarborough, one of the things that we do is that if you talk to developers who come in, they'll tell you that they like to work in Scarborough because they know what to expect. We don't change our rules midstream. We do what, for one person what we do for every person. When we okayed this, remember it's a contract zone. When we okayed this contract zone, this is what we okayed. And now you admit that really it, the only reason for not doing it is because it doesn't seem as if it's necessary. I think it's necessary because it was what it was, it was decided, and what it was, it was voted upon, and I don't understand why we can't just do it. So I would definitely not be in favor of the uh, changing what it is that we had requested Especially, I mean, just, just from the standpoint of the people who own this building, why wouldn't you want the consistency? Anyway, part of it is aesthetics, but most of it is process. So, thank you. Thank you. Roger? I would, uh, I tend to agree with Nick on this. Um, I don't think, I think you explained the way, the reasoning behind what you want to do, and I think it's very logical makes sense to me. Um, I guess we all drive through the, by the place all the time. I think I think it's a, an attractive building and with the landscaping. I think it looks even better. <coughs> and I don't think this this addition and is is such a prominent part of this whole structure that it's going to make that much of a difference. So I would I would go with what you want to do. I, I see no problem with that at all. Thank you. Robin? Um, I tend to see both sides of the issue. I, I agree with uh, Nick on aesthetic, but I agree with Susan on process. And um, uh, real quickly, Mr. Chair, are we talking about item condition number three at all tonight? Uh, we, can, we can certainly discuss it, but there's, uh, there isn't really any action expected because of us since it's a staff coordination, okay. something that we sort of delegated to staff at the time. Because my one of my concerns about number three is process also. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it, with respect to number three, they said when when you put in certain um, drainage features, there's a process that says that you will update and and do the maintenance every year. Yep. And even that's not the same as uh, some evaluation that says it's functioning as intended. It's about the process. 
So I'm on the fence. I, I, I don't see a significant difference in the aesthetic, but I, I agree with Ms. Oglis that it is about the process and it's about the word that this is what, what was said to the town during negotiations. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I don't know whether I'll end up being a tiebreaker or not, but um, I absolutely agree with, with, with Nick and with Roger about, um, and what Robin just said about the fact that this really doesn't make a huge visual impact and that it's, by definition, it's fairly subjective. But I guess where I come down on it in the end is that you know, I might be looking at this differently if there were not a pre-existing, previously agreed upon condition. So to use kind of a sports analogy, I would look at it, sort of anyone who watches you know, football or baseball and they go to replay review, and the play on the field, the ruling on the field usually has the, that's sort of the default ruling, unless there's something that's really compelling to overrule that. Um, not to take that metaphor too far, but, uh, or that analogy too far, but, I sort of look at it similarly that this condition is there and it's memorialized and it was voted on and agreed to. And so as a question of process, with this being a, a, a contract zone, my feeling is that the applicant should comply with that condition. Um, and I appreciate hearing from the applicant's representative that they're prepared to do so if that's the, if that's the the wish of the board. Um, so as, as, was, as, out, as was outlined in staff's uh, memo, it's a, it's a little bit unusual <laughs> in terms of what the board action is or, or, or is not, as the case may be. Um, so if the board as a whole were comfortable that the proposed redesign, um, basically the relief that the applicant is seeking is okay, um, then there would need to be some board action to to grant that. Um, otherwise, the board would not act, and the, the condition would would remain. Um, so, I guess if if we're if the board were to go in the direction that I personally recommend, and that I believe Susan uh, recommends, we would not act on this at all. And, and uh, by default, the, the condition would remain. I hope I didn't over-explain that, but I just wanted to make that clear. So with that said, I mean, we can, we can sort of do a straw poll to see where folks stand um, and then go from there. Uh, so I guess any, all those in favor of um, keeping the existing condition as is, <coughs> could raise your hand. All right. So we have three out of five who have indicated that we would like the condition to remain. Did you have a question or I, I do, because uh, this is being foretold as a, this was an open item and never closed at any time. We were to come back before the board. This was an open item from our original proposal for the uh, single, you know, the double bay. We're now doing the four bays and it was never closed, so it's not like it was ever approved and we're asking, it just was left open. So we're not trying to pull a fast one and asking. No, I don't think anyone's suggesting you're pulling a fast one. It's just that, the, I mean, and these things do get, and maybe Jay can speak yeah. a little bit more to the process, but, um, well, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the way the condition was written is that the board, um, the comment and, st and staff comments going back I leading into the board meeting was about the design standards mm -hmm. seeking to coordinate the building and that these corner treatments and the apron would, you know, might be something the board would want to consider. And based on the board's consideration, they, the condition was that the, the car wash be revised for, and then provided to staff for review and approval in that light. So at this point, Staff not approving the what you've proposed tonight because it doesn't meet that condition. So the board's condition delegated final review and approval to staff based on the corner treatment it, it, yeah. and and the the, um, the apron component. So I guess that would be my concern is is that we're not seeing trying to 
step outside of the process. My understanding it was it was still an open issue to be reviewed because it was never closed. So it, it wasn't, in my opinion, a process issue where we were trying to, you know, uh, go back and revisit a settled item. We, it, in our mind, it was still open, and that's how we approached it. So, I mean, we'll obviously abide by what the board says, but you know, that was our process. I, I appreciate that, and I don't think any of us are suggesting that you're that you're trying to go outside of any appropriate process. I think it's just uh, the way that we're thinking about sort of what our threshold is for sort of deviating from what we had thought of as sort of the default condition. So um, it's not, you know, it's not personal. It's not specific no, no, to, the yeah. to the application. Um, and it is, as I said, it's, a, it's an unusual set of circumstances. Um, Roger, did you I have mean, something else? Certainly, if the board, I'm, I'm sorry, Roger, oh, go, go ahead. Go on. Uh, um, I was just going to say, if the board does feel strongly that the um, that the proposal, or no, not the proposal, the the uh, plan that was shown to you that does show the corn treatment and apron is the one that should move forward. That that's all that staff should be approving. You can certainly sort of approve that tonight, but I think that's that was ta staff's understanding of the way the original condition was read. That that was what the board's expectation was. So. Again, I, I want to leave it. Uh, be I sure the board, the board. Leave it to the staff. Whatever he wants to do. Take care. Roger. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> the only thing I was going to say is uh, we've had a number of discussions when you've been before us on this, and uh, this to me is this this structure is such an insignificant portion of this whole complex, and I understand. The you know, the precedent and everything like that. But I think, to me, is explained because of the material they're using, you know, um, and, and the need and, and, the, and the cost and everything associated with it. Um, I just I just don't see it. If, it. if it was a bigger, if it was a more significant portion of the structure, then I can, I can see. No, I think, and I, and I appreciate and respect that, and I, I just, I think we, we have different opinions, and that this is where this job in some ways is the most difficult when we do get into these um, grayer areas um, and it's it's uncomfortable in some ways but um, I think I, you know I've made clear where 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 I am on this and um, you know if some if someone else or other board members want to try and take it in a different direction that's that's their prerogative I just have one vote uh, but that's as chair and as you know one voting member that's that's my position, my recommendation, and it sounds like the applicant is prepared to do it. Um, sure, it's not their first choice, but um, I think unless unless someone has something else or another proposed approach, I'd like to move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So we will. So the next one, Mr. Chair, as I, I noted at, at the outset, this one does require board action because this this was a condition that you hadn't delegated to staff with with clear direction. Um, the board wanted to see the the new landscape plan, and so um, the board will be taking either an action to approve, deny, <coughs> or request that they come back. Um, and again, um, at the board's at the board's choosing and. Um, Staff provides some comments with uh, some background in terms of our design standards and the street streetscape standards of the TVC3, and is it with that? Thank you, Jay. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Downing. Um, as Dave mentioned, I also work at Garn Turgeon. Uh, I was I've not been involved with this project from the beginning, so I don't exactly know the entire process that we've been talking about. Uh, However, that being said, uh, I have been tasked with uh, providing a landscape plan that in some ways at least mimics and, and maybe improves upon the original landscape plan that was approved at some point. Uh, the current landscape plan that we are providing and uh, asking for approval for today uh, aims to accomplish four main things. Uh, these things are to continue the established street tree plantings along Route 1. We are proposing two new maples. Uh, currently, there are, I think, three or four oaks um, 
there and one maple on the property uh, as street trees. The oaks are not doing great. The one maple seems to be much more successful and it is also adjacent to the two locations that we are putting or proposing trees. We are proposing maples, Freeman maples. A uh, very great street tree. Uh, it's a hybrid that is urban tolerant. Uh, tough to really knock that, that particular species. Uh, the second goal was to buffer the new front curved uh, display lot and extend the linear bed along Route 1 uh, towards the south. I know that that, um, from my understanding, that was at least one of the major uh, items that uh, seemed to be uh, up in the air. Uh, ex how far do we extend that bed along Route 1? Um, and if you see on the plan here, this is what I'm talking about right here. We've extended, this is the limits of the current bed right here. We've extended it another uh, little bit over 100 feet. Um, we've got <coughs> some junipers and roses, similar species that are already there. Uh, and then again, one of our maples. We have a gap for some lawn. And then the other uh, street side planting right here with the other street tree. Uh, three, <laughs> buffer the rear lot. Uh, at some point in time, in this location here, there had been some evergreen trees. They're not there anymore. We're replacing them with a low hedge. Again, more roses, similar species that are already throughout the site. Also with some catmint and some grasses that they've introduced already over in some of the, veget or the uh, drainage swale areas. And the fourth main goal was to replace the three trees uh, that were that are demoed dur uh, during construction. So again, in the lot back here, these you'll see right here. This part is nuked uh, due to the proposed building. We're just replacing those trees right there. Again, uh, the. There were four main goals. We wanted to uh, reestablish the Route 1 plantings, uh, the, the street side tree plantings, um, and also buffer some of the parking in the back. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And again, for the record, um, we have opportunity for public comment. Anyone wants to come on up? Seeing none. Go to the board, and would you like to start, Susan? Sure. Um, thank you very much for the street trees. There was some question the last time around whether we were going to have street trees, and I'm very pleased that they that they showed up. It's great. Um, there would be things I would do differently, but the point is that I think that this this meets what we were looking for. Um, street trees are what were most important to me. And I see that the, I, I forgot the sign was going to wait, be down there. Yeah, we would definitely would have added another tree right there, but yes, there's That's going to be a proposed sign, sign right there. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I don't have any really major questions. I have a, I have a question that has nothing to do with this, that since you're here, I'm going to ask anyway. On the opposite end of this, on the northerly end of this, is what I think is the best part of your landscaping, whether it's Kaiser up higher, great landscaping, but it hasn't been maintained this summer. So <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. Maybe somebody would like to go and weed it. But in the meantime, it's great landscaping. And this, this will do. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Roger? Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think it looks terrific. Um, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious, what, how does this process go from here? If this gets approved, if mm -hmm. this are we actually going to see something happen? Or? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I think that's the idea. Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, I think it looks looks really really good. So um, okay. I don't I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Nick. I'm all set. Thank you, Robin. Um, yeah. So Susan started to hit on the one question that I had. Um, I know it's the um, site plan review ordinance um, section F. 9A, a written maintenance plan shall be provided for the landscape elements to be installed on the site. So I think it really addresses what Susan brought out is 
when will the maintenance plan be submitted and will it include these revisions? Uh, I absolutely uh, can include that on the, directly right on the plan uh, for the uh, revised version that could be approved. But yes, absolutely, that can be and, and so the contractor, whoever does this, you know, property management or maintenance will receive a copy of that maintenance plan, correct? You, yeah, you don't necessarily speak for the develop the, the owner right now, I, I get that, but just I'd like to see that, that uh, loop be closed. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just say, in addition sure. to that, um, the uh, roses, it says very clearly that the roses will be pruned annually and, of course, with having those on my property, I know how important it is to have them pruned. That will be included in the... Um, yeah, that's just the roses, but yeah, I didn't get everything else. Yes. Thank you. The, yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the, the thoughtful approach to this and the responsiveness to the, to the prior comments. Um, and um, yeah, as, as Susan alluded to, we could all kind of go in and and have our little critiques on different things. But <coughs> we're, not the, we're not the landscape architects. And um, I'm, I'm, again, glad to see that this was taken in sort of a you know, comprehensive, thoughtful way and look forward to seeing, the, seeing it um, come to fruition. Um, so with that, um, I would like to move that the board um, approve, well, the wording here is a little tricky. We're, we're essentially finding that the um, that the applicant's landscape plan meets the town standards and requirements and is compliant. Um, that need to be I, don't know that, I don't know that we need to be much more formal than that. We haven't got a second to uh, vote on right. or any of that. Uh, I, I would have a, I, I do think a second in a, in a vote okay. would be appropriate because the condition that. was that it come back to the, okay, I'll leave okay. that. You're usually the procedural guru. Yeah, I, I think it's good to incorporate it into the approval. Yeah. Any further discussion? We have a second. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, we do have item number three on which uh, board, board, in, board input um, or condition number three, <coughs> which um, as was alluded to earlier, there's no board action expected, but board input is welcome. And Robin, I know you started to speak to that earlier. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to that um, or anyone else? Just um, knowing, knowing the expertise of the town um, staff, it's, there, it's in good hands. But I think just that Susan bringing up the whole idea of process um, just fit in nicely with that. So okay. I'm fine with the staff taking care of that. And again, just for, for folks who may not be following along, on the agenda, this was related to condition number three, that prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall revise the plans to address staff comments related to stormwater management and vehicle display and parking areas. So if I could add to that, Corey, sure. um, what we had asked for in, as part of the condition was uh, documents um, that the, the stormwater management features had been um, maintained appropriately as designed and instead of getting those records, what we got was, I believe, was basically just a certification from a PE, and I haven't seen it in the packet, but I assume that that's what Angela received, saying that the stormwater features are functioning as intended. So what I would just remind the, the owner to do is, in the future, to have that maintenance of the stormwater features done moving forward, because the site does discharge to the town's um, stormwater MS4 system, which is regulated by the Clean Water Act. Come on up. There you go. Thank you. During this, pro <laughs> Hi. During this process, we put together a document based on what other municipalities do. It's part of their regular program. It's a, uh, a monthly, half-year, yearly process, where, and also it includes after each rain event to go out and to inspect the uh, detention area to remove debris and, and to make sure that the inlet is not been compromised by water flow and, and whatnot. And so that's part of their maintenance program now, which sure. they didn't have prior to. A excellent. Um, glad that we know that. Um, but what, what sometimes is required is that DEP will require that a maintenance contract, proof of an executed contract with a third party 
to do that is required. So I would just encourage, just like the maintenance plan be done with, with a certain contractor, that the stormwater maintenance be, be included in that. Okay. It can be one and the same, but it's got to be looked at in order for it to keep functioning as intended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have anything on, on that or any other aspect of the <coughs> condition? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So again, I, I think the, the think issue is that by the board not taking action, then the existing condition stands. And the existing condition reads that prior to the issuance of the building permit, the architectural plan set shall be revised and submitted to the planning staff for review and approval of the details of the car wash portion of the building expansion. Materials and architectural features shall coordinate with the existing building materials. And I think based on the board's prior discussions leading up to this condition, when coupled with staff comments and then clearly uh, discussed at tonight's meeting, the expectation is around the, the <coughs> corner treatment and the apron um, as you showed during no. tonight's meeting. We need to come back to the next meeting. Nope. Uh, it's, it's a staff review at this point. The, the board has delegated yep. the staff review. Great, thank you. And if we can't come to an agreement, we come back here, but I think we... I'll get you the details. Right. We'll be fine. <laughs> I think we can get there. Thank you. All right, thank you. I thought I saw Elliot poke his head in, so... Yep, I think we're there. <laughs> Which, you know, is this? Summoning our next applicant. She's getting there. They're out there. We did go out of order. Oh, my goodness. All right. You showed up. The next item, uh, Dunstan Properties LLC requests a sketch plan review for Route <coughs> 1 and Stewart Drive, Assessor's Map U30, Lots 16 and 17. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item actually started with the board back last summer through a plan development review process culminating in a master plan uh, back in, I believe it was August of 2015. Um, this project, as board members, uh, Likely note, it's obviously a fairly, fairly large and complex project that has sort of a couple layers of review. There's a subdivision in terms of the, the lots and the, the, the unit types, but then each individual building is going to require a site plan in and of itself to sort of show how it fits into the overall subdivision impacts. What the applicant has requested the board to do is to begin a sketch plan review of a few of those buildings um, so that they could potentially be pretty well queued up um, or at least have some of the items discussed and uh, get direction from the board in terms of um, the, the principal items that they uh, are seeking to address tonight are the overall landscaping plan, architectural details for I think it's six of the buildings, One, one's the restaurant, the other are the commercial, um, uh, I'm sorry, residential um, buildings, um, and then also they did provide an overall uh, lighting plan that the board uh, could provide some comments on. Um, so I'm not sure how, Mr. Chair, you would like to sort of take it. If you want to take it all in one, I can sort of go over my comments, or if we want to take it sort of piece by piece, I'll, I'll, I'll look to you to ask how much of my, my staff comments you want me to go over or just cover as part of your, your deliberation. Yeah, why don't you give us, just give us a very yep. brief recap okay. of, of each item, and then we'll, we'll sort of take it together with the understanding that we're going to, you know, it's a sketch review. We're just starting the conversation, and yep. we'll work our way through step by step. So in terms of the landscaping plan, um, this is the TVC district. TVC district has uh, a certain streetscape performance uh, standard expectations along the Route 1 corridor, um, which by and large the applicant seems to be addressing in terms of the, the depth um, I guess the question would be in terms of ensuring that there's proper sort of uh, or adequate uh, uh, um, visual buffers to the, the parking spaces that are directly abutting Route 1 
typically it's not looking for maybe a full screening, but at least, you know, providing some, uh, some level of minimizing that view. Um, I think that was sort of the, the main element in landscaping, um, as well as I should, should note that um, uh, there's TVC does look for under standard space and bulk requirements a 25-foot setback from residentially zoned properties. We'll note that this has gone through plan development review process, so the planning board does have some flexibility um, with those space and bulk standards. <coughs> um, however, consideration to ensuring adequate buffering to the residential zones would seem uh, appropriate and, and consistent with what the zoning is looking for in the area. Um, in terms of the table and tap restaurant site, as it's referred to, um, the principal issue there that staff identified is that a TVC district requires uh, buildings to be at least two stories or 20 feet in height over 50% of the building and it doesn't appear based on what we've uh, were provided that it meets that standard. Um, so that's something we'll need to, to talk about. Um, the apartment building H5, that's the larger uh, 36 unit, I think it is, somewhere in that 34 unit building. Um, uh, essentially, that, you know, I, I think just in terms of um, the architectural standards and our design standards, just ensuring, I think the main thing staff identified was ensuring adequate um, detailing around the windows because there's, you know, a nice, you know, I think the building overall sort of meets the materials and expectations, so just want to be sure that all the trimmings are in place, so to speak. Um, <coughs> and I guess in terms of this might sort of harkens back to the landscaping note, but um, there is proposal to use some hemlocks, uh, particularly on the back side, to sort of buffer the, the residential building to the abutting commercial properties. Um, and just knowing that there have been some hemlocks uh, in the area in, in southern Maine and, and south of us that have been uh, hit by some invasive species, we might want to just be sure that we're putting a, a, a tree that's going to remain um, and, and not fall um, uh, in, in to that. Uh, then finally, there's uh, four three-unit townhouses. Um, and I guess the principal issue there is that the design standards call for any sides of a building that are abutting a parking lot, public ways, um, to really complement and, and uh, coordinate well with the uh, primary facades and so there, there appears to be some blank walls um, that do abut those travel ways that the board and applicant might want to talk about. Sort of an overall architectural discussion, you know, I think it, it appears from what staff was able to see that they're really talking about using high quality materials, um, but they do call for a vinyl, so I think it will be important for the board to know what that vinyl is because there are varying degrees of vinyl. So. Um, but based on what the submission is, I think there's likelihood that the applicant's thinking about that. And, um, and then finally, in terms of site lighting, uh, the only cutoff fixture staff was able to see in the, in the materials was a uh, sort of a, what, what I call sort of a pedestrian style, um, traditional lamp post, if you will, um, which I believe is, has been utilized in other areas of the Dunstan crossing the residential side of things. And so, you know, there, uh, there could well be some appropriate areas, particularly along the main boulevard or, or maybe those main street areas, that storefront areas, to use that type of feature, um, fixture. But maybe in the, in the sort of corner parking lots, what have you, maybe more full cutoff fixtures. Um, and then another item that was noted today by our engineer um, as she was looking through the plans did notice that there are some hot spots, if you will, in the, in the uh, lighting um, across the site. And so just ensuring that the, uh, the photometric plan meets the town standards in terms, if you, in our design standards, the lighting chapter has some standards around ratio of lighting. And, uh, and so just being sure that that's um, a second look is, is had at that. I have a blank page, so I'm done. Right. <laughs> that page intentionally left blank. Right, well, thanks for that recap and overview. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Planning Board members. My name is Tom Emery. I'm a licensed landscape architect of Foresight Architects. Here this evening with Mark Burns, uh, principal and owner of Foresight Architects. And of course, you know Elliot. 
I, I can speak very quickly and briefly regarding uh, the issues that Jay has raised. Uh, I don't know if there are people here who weren't here before, but just for quick orientation on this board, Route 1 is at the bottom of the sheet. Stewart Drive runs uh, east-west. Uh, we have several buildings around the site. This is the uh, restaurant building. Uh, this is a future uh, office building. This is a future office building. This is the future building with a drive-in, whether it's a restaurant or uh, office or bank, is to be determined. Uh, this is a two-story building, uh, retail both floors. This is a pavilion that overlooks the uh, central core and uh, green space in another building uh, that's also a two-story office. Here, are, these are the location of the three-unit apartment building townhouses, and anchoring this entire green space is the three-story apartment building. Uh, with respect to the uh, Route 1 buffer, we have uh, provided miscellaneous uh, plants, evergreens and, and deciduous, and flowering uh, deciduous trees uh, between the parking and Route 1. Uh, we've also provided a little more evergreen planting here to help screen the drive through. But picking up on Jay's comment, the, uh, I think what would be helpful here would be to put a berm in so that when you are driving by, you can still look under the trees and see the attractive buildings in the background. But that would have also help to screen uh, the, the parking lot. Uh, with respect uh, to the uh, description for the underground utilities and how that works with the landscaping, we'll coordinate that with, as you know, Sean Frank will be in from Sebago Technics, and Sean and I and Mark are working very closely along with Elliot uh, to be sure all of that is coordinated. Now that he's uh, developed his uh, civil plans a little more fully, we can uh, do the final coordination on that. Uh, Jay had raised a, an issue regarding the choice of trees along Stewart Drive and used the term boulevard effect. Actually, Stewart Drive is a fairly narrow drive. It, it has, uh, it, it is our, the, the core of the village, so to speak. And the reason we're proposing flowering trees and lower scale trees along there is that the buildings are two stories. And there isn't a tree that grows successfully in pavement if it's, if it's uh, like, say, a red maple or an oak, uh, those trees are very full, very thick, and, and not only do they provide too much shade, they tend to pull away from the building or grow away from them. We feel it's much more appropriate with a, the pedestrian scale we have, opportunities for outdoor dining and so forth, that we use a lower scale uh, flowering tree. And if any of you uh, know where uh, at the corner of Broadway and Route 77, there's a pizza joint on that corner and there's a lovely row of flowering mm -hmm. uh, apples there, I believe, and that's the scale of tree that we're looking for. They're fuller, they're not the, the um, low, low uh, dwarf style. These are nice full trees and a very attractive uh, spring show. Uh, some of the trees that we have selected are not on the plant list. We have endeavored to use the plant list as much as possible, uh, but inevitably what we find is with respect to whether it's the hemlock are almost in, you know, green ash, white ash. Every tree, including uh, the famous uh, elms, are plagued by some pest. And I have a, an approach to a philosophy without spending money, the client's money foolishly, but to continue to include trees that are nursery grown, that are cer cer certified to be pest free, and the woolly algae is the uh, pest that is attacking the hemlocks. I have a whole row of hemlocks behind my house uh, that are now 20, 30 feet tall, and they've, they've continued to be quite healthy. We have some up camp that have grown probably 15 feet in the last 10 years. So uh, what is really critical is to be sure they're brought in uh, as nursery stock from certified sources and not brought in from out of state. So that's generally what we, we use, and then generally what we do with, with uh, large-scale plantings like that is to be sure to mix the species and varieties so that we don't have a monoculture. Um, with respect to keying all the plants on the uh, plant list, we have been uh, more concerned about describing what the plants are to do and then, as you have with your own plant list, is to provide a list of plants that uh, the client and contractor can draw from that will meet that need. Uh, since this project won't be built all at once, um, that will provide an opportunity for substitutions 
inevitably what happens when, when it comes planting time, certain plants aren't available and substitutions are necessary. So they have a palette from which to choose. But generally speaking, when we get into the 20 scale plans, the restaurant plan, the uh, uh, apartment building plan, we try to call out or we have called out uh, by uh, genus and species the specific plans shown on, plants shown on those plants. Uh, with respect to the 25-foot setback, uh, we've been bringing this plan forward now for uh, well over a year and have been aware that we don't have a 25-foot setback everywhere. So what we will propose, what we're proposing to do is to provide a buffer. And as we look more closely at the grading between uh, the existing properties along the boundary and our parking lot, for example, some of the parking areas are lower, which means the abutters would overlook that parking lot. And the uh, other aspect is that some of the budding property, uh, particularly to the south, has a very uh, dense stand of pine trees. So depending upon the grades, we'll either add more trees in those areas that are sensitive or look at a length of fence uh, that would also help to provide a, a buffer instantly. Uh, I will let uh, Mark get into the, uh, the architectural aspects. The other thing that I recall that came up was the issue of showing pad-mounted uh, utilities, uh, mechanical equipment, and as far as I know, at least in my files uh, for the table and tap restaurant, we show uh, at the bottom of the sheet, you'll see three pads there, I believe, uh, for uh, the mechanical equipment, and we show the underground grease trap there as well. So I believe that's most of the points that uh, were made with respect to the landscaping. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, with respect to the lighting, uh, the uh, Decorative fixtures, the ones that people traditionally think of as lanterns, uh, will be or they're proposed to be LED fixtures. And what happens with those is that the light is actually projected up and comes down. It's not, it's not a globe type that just uh, throws uh, light in all directions. So that does have uh, cutoff capabilities. And with respect to the issue with hot spots or, or uh, meeting the town standards, uh, Swaney Lighting has done the photometric plan for us and working closely with them and adjusting uh, light locations and the height of lights. Um, we've, we've added a couple of 12-foot poles so that we avoid those hot spots, but we know on the perimeter there's a couple of places where we're not quite meeting the trespass and what they will do is call out for a shield. There'll be a, a physical plate put in those fixtures in those locations so that the light is not allowed to go uh, across the property line. And the reason that's not modeled is there's no way of modeling it. I mean, they don't have something in their program. All they can do is, is uh, use the, the house side cutoff that's the most uh, rigorous in that location, and then we'll add a note to the plan to specifically point out where those uh, locations are for the lights that have that additional uh, shielding added to them for that purpose. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. My name is Mark Burns. I'd like to speak to the uh, to the comments directly. Uh, you know, as this is a sketch plan, these are these are really working sessions uh, to some degree to help inform you as to how the project uh, came about and, and where the, some of the decisions are made to uh, sort of give you the sense that that as we go through the reviews of this project, you have a sort of a basis by which you know, our thought process applies to the project. Um, I'd probably start with, this is the most significant of all, Jay, and you said it, was the Table and Tap restaurant, which is a, um, as most restaurants are, single story structure of sorts when you think about how it's used. Um, the second story had no, had no function. Um, but that wasn't to say that we'd preclude a restaurant in a development such as this, because in a mixed-use development, the restaurant really makes a, uh, a great addition to that, that fabric. Uh, it's not a fast food. It's a, uh, it's a, a upscale sort of sit-down, casual, though. And um, I think the, uh, the intention would be to present a building that I know you have drawings, but 
you know, looks something like this. Uh, we're just starting to look at colors. Um, Elliot has one that we're, we're going to look at as well that might have this nice case, Cape Cod gray shingle on the top and maybe a uh, uh, sort of a, a little bit a light goldish yellow with a cream trim. You know, so it has this nice soft feel. Um, it, what's really important about it is that we're thinking about the entire development when we think about buildings one at a time because uh, we are trying to get this to unify as a sense of place. We, um, in addressing that the two-story aspect, we have a building that's 23 feet, two inches high, and um, we think we meet the 20, but um, without, with no purpose to put a second story, we've, we've provided false dormers. And those dormers are to imply that you know, there could be a half story that's more traditional as uh, appealing to that second story uh, thought process. Um, the building itself is, uh, has some really nice touches to it, we believe, in the sense that um, it has a New England feel to it. It's using um, natural, mater natural looking materials and a feel of you know, something that's pretty well grounded, both traditionally and a little, with a little contemporary look to it too. Because obviously copying the traditional or historic really doesn't advance a community. Uh, but adhering to its roots is what gives people a level of comfort and association. We have a nice stone base. We have a clabbered uh, midsection with a a uh, shingled upper portion that is flared and uh, and then again on the side where you ordinarily have a large uh, uh, gable side, we've broken that down in scale again with these elements and, and raised windows. Um, I'd love to, do, do you want to address these one at a time or would you like to, to uh, just keep going? And just go ahead and keep going with the with the overview, and then when we have okay. board comment, we can tackle any specific items. Great. The next question had to do with venting systems on the building, and uh, we are designing at present the mechanical systems. We do expect to have chillers or condensers on pads. They will be masked as much as possible with either fencing or uh, buffers. Uh, landscape buffers. We don't know their sizes at this time. We, uh, we also are trying to conceal a lot of the air handling units that are associated with this and we've concealed those within the roof on this side. Uh, you'll notice um, in, your, in your drawings that there is, a, there is a louver on the side that's to pull air in. The air will be exhausted on the back side of the building, and um, it's our intention to, to hide most of those elements as much as we're able to. Um, they do need to have some prominence as far as functionality, um, but uh, such as um, there's another question rega regarding the kitchen vents and the, um, and the uh, toilet exhaust on the apartment building. The toilet exhaust will be will be grouped and then uh, brought to ducts and centralized and then brought up to the roof. And um, that building is large enough that it's a flat roof in the center portion. What we've done is we've we've given the appearance, and again, all of these are using you know fairly steep pitches, not flat pitches. Uh, again, that's more appealing, more traditional um, on the apartment building. We have an 812 pitch. We bring it back into the building, probably 15, 16 feet. The building almost 60 feet across, and and then we drop it as a parapet. And then we locate all of our mechanical equipment out of view of the development <coughs> and the neighbors. Uh, the next was uh, building lighted uh, mounted lighting. Uh, <coughs> You were wondering where that was. 
Uh, we did show some on the, on the restaurant structure uh, in which we placed it over a sign. Uh, that would be typically a gooseneck fixture with a cutoff. And um, the other lights we're trying to make almost non-existent. We're, we're thinking that uh, they are uh, uh, recessed lighting underneath canopies, which would be full <coughs> cutoff and would light the ground but not necessarily the spaces around it. There is a possibility that we may use some ground-mounted lighting on the face of the building. The trim details on the apartment building and on the restaurant uh, are very important to us. Um, we have shown uh, one by six on the apartment, on the restaurant, for sort of the, the surround trim. Uh, on the apartment building, we did show one by four. Um, we will look at what one by six looks like on that as well to see how it proportionally fits. Uh, colors and materials uh, to be provided. Uh, I, again, we're at Sketch Plan and we. Um, we're exploring colors too, and uh, as I said, this is very important to the development that we get it right on the first couple because everything else follows. Uh, we do want to have a New England feel to it. We do want to use colors that feel both traditional and um, a little bit you know, exciting for people to feel like you know this is a special place, special place. So we are looking to introduce some colors, but we're not looking at lime greens. We're not looking at oranges. So um, the vinyl siding will be a high standard siding. Uh, I have talked to Elliot about that, and uh, we're actually looking to use the, the highest quality that Certainty provides. Um, and uh, to differentiate between the panels and the, uh, the siding, the siding will be clapboards or shingles. We won't be using large paneled surfaces unless it's a signage of sorts. Most of it will be built up trim if it's if it's any flat stock at all. So I think that answers okay. those. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Do you have, do your team have anything else or just uh, Elliot, sorry, speak to the uh, townhouse here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, he didn't touch much upon the uh, the four three-unit buildings. That's a building that we've done in five and six-unit designs in Saco. It's the layout has worked extremely well. Um, in this particular design, you'll see we broke it down to a three-unit style. In uh, Jay's right, we do have the ends of those buildings that don't have um, anything on them at all. So you have two blank gabled ends. Um, we're trying something different on this one where we're actually facing the three unit buildings towards each other. So you actually walk into, say, a courtyard and you'll either turn left or right depending on which, which building you live in. Um, so those, the back of the buildings face. Um, is, there, is there a sketch for this in your, is there a sketch up there yeah. for this? Uh-huh. Oh, I didn't mean to make such a big production. <laughs> you are? I did. <laughs> I didn't mean to make such a big production. <laughs> yeah, we have so many. It's come to you already. Projects. Already, I'm in trouble. Yeah. It's okay. Is it this that you're looking for? Okay, okay. There we go. Thanks. So this was a design that we actually did it in, like I said, five and six unit designs. We took our six unit and literally cut the building in half and then changed, modified the roof to fit this. Um, and then you can see along the site plan, 
each pair actually faces each other. And then the back of this building faces uh, this commercial, and the back of this one faces uh, north towards the larger apartment building. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is something a little different. We do end up with gable ends with our design that, that don't have anything on them. Um, that's good and bad. It is a, it is a large blank wall. Um, our anticipation would be to increase uh, landscaping or fencing on those ends. Um, but it works out very good for the layout where you don't have, where they're in such close proximity to the roadways or the parking lot areas, you don't have headlights and people looking in uh, people's units. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of give and take. So I'm thinking with the addition of a heavier landscape or a fencing or some type of decoration, um, we are willing to look at some type of, uh, introduce maybe some type of trim detail that we can do where we're not introducing windows or doors, but to give it something besides the blank wall. Um, besides that, those buildings would have the amount of plaid um, and we do plan on using what is a monogram siding by certainty, which is their, their highest grade of, of clapboard siding um, on any place that we do have uh, vinyl. Um, so, it, I mean, they're really straightforward. Um, we've gone through all the parking requirements. Uh, we've met all the parking. Um, uh, we, you know, the, the, the park in the middle, pocket park, if you will, looking down towards the larger scale three unit building um, was something Tom introduced and it, it has become probably one of the more focal points with the open pavilion. Um, it's, you know, we're trying to develop a sense of place, if you will, uh, that not only you, that you might live at or you might shop at or eat at, but it also might be a place where you might just go for a walk bring your own lunch, take your dog to, um, whatever the case may be. Obviously, this is connected. This is the connection to phase four into Dunstan Crossing, which our intention is to open uh, phase four, so there will now be a connection over to the current phase uh, two. Uh, that is just dead ends on Waldron Drive. Um, so everything, if it goes as planned next April, when the paving plants open back up, we'd be paving that section you see a restaurant opening in May or June, um, people moving in at that same time uh, on this, and you'd be able to drive completely through from Broad Turn Road all the way out to Route 1. Okay. And, and obviously, to talk a little bit about uh, process. Obviously, this is sketch plan. There is a lot going on, but, but like Tom said, we've seen this plan. Um, the advantage of doing the master plan was this has been looked at quite a bit already and it's been around. We really haven't changed much at all from the master plan. Um, actually, I don't think we've changed anything. Um, except now just getting into the actual uh, building details themselves. Um, Sean is hoping to be here from Sebago Tech at the next planning board and, and we would, there's a good chance we will be here uh, at that meeting or at least at the second meeting in October, hoping that Sean will wrap up all of the site items, drainage, traffic, um, uh, more of those site details and this will all come together at the second meeting in October. Um, but obviously because there is so much, Jay was gracious enough to let us come in at, at an earlier meeting so that we could start to hit upon any questions that related to lighting, landscaping, buildings and not have um, you know, a four or five, six hour marathon session with everything going on in one night. So um, if there's anything we can answer or talk about, we'd be glad to. Thank you. Uh, before we do turn to board discussion, um, I just wanted to note for the record for members of the public that um, next time these, this uh, applicant comes in, we will have the opportunity for public comment. Uh, typically for sketch, this, as was alluded to, is really more of kind of a preliminary kind of combination status update <coughs> and, and work session in a way and, and kind of general um, general update and some, some basic feedback and Q&A. Next time, when the project is sort of, um, you know, been fleshed out a little more, is when we typically have public comments. So, um, I did just want to put that out there for the record. Um, and on that note, uh, would you like to start this time, Roger? Sure. Thanks. <coughs> um, before I ask a question to the applicant, I have a question for Jay, and it's regarding the, um, the two-story restaurant mm -hmm. requirement in the TVC. Yep. Um, as I recall, the TVCs were designed for like true village, like in a town, like at 
at Oak Hill and, and down at Dunstan and places like that, like the uh, drugstore, that type of thing. Huh? Um, is this cast in stone that this has to be two-story or? Mm -hmm. So the zoning ordinance, it's so, it, yeah, the space and bulk standards of the TVC said, say the uh, building needs to be 20 feet in height over at least 50% of the building, two stories or the 20 feet. In, and that's, that's the zoning standard, so the applicant will, there's, this board doesn't have any discretion over that, whereas um, we sort of talked through the plan development process. There are space and bulk standards in the TVC through the plan development review process. This board does have flexibility with in terms of setbacks or um, those type of things, but this is one that um, the zoning spells it out explicitly in both conventional and plan. Well, how, how is that measured, Jay? You're, you're saying 20 feet in height, which we're already 23 to the peak, so how is that measured? Yeah, so our definition of building height is... You uh, said 20 or uh, two stories, 20 feet or two stories. Yep, so I can, I can read it to you. Um, <coughs> but I think I'm... So... Space and bulk standards of the TVC, a building must be either a minimum of two stories or 20 feet in height over at least 50% of the building footprint. And building height <coughs> is defined vertical distance measured from the average elevation of the finished grade at the front of the building to the highest point of the roof on a flat or mansard roof and to the average height between the eaves and the ridge of, for all other types of roofs. So it would be that average height between their eaves and the ridge line, which I think they've shown on their plans at about 14.8. So, so right, we, right, if you measure it to the peak, it's about 20. If you right. measure it halfway up the roof, it, it's probably 16, 17. Mm -hmm. I think your plans show it at about 14.8, okay. if I'm not mistaken. So that, that's the issue, that they need to show compliance with these zoning warrants. And yeah. in fact, that does apply in our favor when we do the three stories. As you can see, we, we laid out dimensions on that and applied the 50% of the slope for the on the right. it, We understand that, mm -hmm. but we also are, are talking about, you know, the appropriateness of a building within the context. And, um, you know, it, it, the scale yeah, yeah and, I, and I guess that I don't obviously know, I wasn't part of any committee that came up with that definition, but it seems like such an arbitrary definition to say just every building has to be two stories or like you say, and to create a mixed use design like we have and to have the variety of uses that we plan to have, it, it just doesn't work. Um, and yet you're telling me that that's a non-negotiable item. What the zoning ordinance says. So I, I guess, I mean, I, I'm not sure which way to take that because to, to sit there and just raise the walls four or five feet for just no reason. Isn't that um, okay? Excuse me for interrupting, but so I, I thought that this, that, but are we talking about the restaurant here? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 I thought the restaurant met the standard. No, it's the restaurant is the only one, it's the one that has. The way, the way Jay is saying they measure it, it's, we're 23 feet, 2 inches to the peak, mm -hmm. but the way the town measures it is halfway between the eave and the peak. So halfway up, we're only 14, 8 or so. So you'd have to be 20 to there. Yeah. i got to be 20, 20 to there, which would put my peak yeah. up to about 25 or 26. Yeah. I actually know, about 29, Perhaps up in the 29 area. Yeah, and, and the reason I, I brought it up, Jay, mm -hmm. because it was, I remember the whole discussions with the TVC zones, and mm -hmm. to me it was in these villages these actual organic, trying to create an organic village in the town, you know, like at Oak Hill and that. And this is actually within a development. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was wondering whether it, it really would still apply to this, you know? So yeah, that is the ordinance. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that the ordinance does talk, does differentiate between the Oak Hill and Dunstan area is in terms of building footprint, yeah. but it doesn't differentiate in terms of building height. Um, so, so I actually like this. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think <laughs> I, know, this, I think I mean, there's a lot of zones in which this would probably meet our design standards. To, to raise this members, building, which would, really would, agree, put but the, would put this building completely out of scale. Yeah. Um. Okay. That, 
did that throw up? Would we only have to let raise 50% of the building to that height? So yeah. potentially the the kitchen areas could be single story, whereas the dining areas could add, I don't know what it is, but we'll figure it out. It could be four feet in order to get you up, or it could be six feet, mm -hmm. but how you do that requires us to be, you know, sort of creative. I was going to say creative is the word that was whether, it's a, whether it looks like a, like a shed dormer or something to lift that wall up and still give you the scale that we want. That's why we have these meetings. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's a good example of the type of thing we want to get into the open. And, and I guess and we can have separate conversations elsewhere about whether the, mm -hmm. that, that ordinance should be reconsidered, yeah. but it is what it is now. So um, I notice on on your plans that you have um, a sign on the end of the restaurant. Is there not going to be a, you're not planning on any signage on the front of the restaurant? Uh, we're still trying to work that out with the the person that's going to be running the restaurant. Um, whether he's going to be looking at either something in the gable or along this two foot uh, shingled area. Um, but obviously we're you know we're trying to play a balance and act between yeah. what he wants and what I want to fit the the entire uh, village, sure. and then also what we'll be doing for uh, some type of marquee sign in front of the project. Too. Oh, that, I, that was going to be my next question, yeah. to you know, something on a road. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I do like the, like the style of the building and everything. Um, the other question, I, th I think the landscaping, if, if you're going to do everything you say you're going to do, it sounds terrific, I think. Um, um, the... the, the um, the end buildings on the townhouses, where the question was about the trim. You know, right here, the yeah. four three-unit yeah. buildings, yep. Do you have any buildings in the other phases that are similar to what, you, what you're doing there? Do they have just blank walls, too, or? Uh, in Dunstan, I don't mm -hmm. think so. Okay. This happens to be the actual building in a five-unit design. It doesn't happen to show the end. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's great. But that, that's two exactly the same. But you're right. It, it is a, you're right, it's like the end of a typical colonial yeah. with nothing in it. But you're right. There are some certainly some trim details you can do to a gable end without adding penetrations, you know, for windows and doors. Obviously, in this situation, um, you're not very far when somebody pulls up to that, to yeah. that building. Um, right. You know, to have a window right there would, would not work well. Um, the sidewalk is, is six feet away. Um, so it doesn't work well from a use point of view, but we are certainly willing to look at some trim details from an architectural point of and view. And that's going to be three stories? Those no, the, these are, this is your typical colonial building. Two story two with a okay, cable. The other one's going to be three. This is the three story. Okay, yeah. all right, okay. Yep. Maybe, maybe it's not going to be quite as large as that. No, a three story gable end with nothing in it would, <laughs> would really. It's yeah. really big. It I would have two up in arms. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. Robin? Thank you. I'd just like to um, give credit to Jay for being put on the spot and being able to go right to those ordinances. I really appreciate <laughs> that. That's He's our ordinance. That's right. right. I didn't mean that's to put you on the spot. Quite a <laughs> talent. <laughs> what I'm here for, right? That's the flying colors. Um, I really appreciated having the master plan as background. I'm new to the planning board, so that was really helpful to me to just take us back to the to the master plan. And so I, I um, was wondering if you could um, just sort of point out a couple features for me or answer a few questions about the larger common plan of development, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. How large is the, 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 the entire plan of development? I know you talked about phase two, phase four. When you, when you include Dunstan Crossing? Mm -hmm. So Dunstan Crossing was approved as a 240-unit uh, subdivision. And that was phase two? That was phase one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four, okay. Yeah. That make up the entire... Now, we have, we have since taken phase four and modifying it, so it will probably end up being four, five, and six. Okay. Four was as big as... It was more than half the project. And is that all residential, Elliot? That's all residential. Okay. Yeah, a okay. mixture of single family, uh, townhomes, yep. uh, different style condos. And so how many acres is, are, are we talking about? In about 120 acres. Okay. 
All right. Um, how much open space uh, is in this design right here? Just what we see in the sort of the courtyard kind of a thing? And right in the, the courtyard, what you're uh, talking about? These two pieces together are just about seven and three quarter acres. This, okay. this whole outline right here. Oh, okay. Uh, so when we talk about Dunstan Crossing, Dunstan Crossing technically starts at this property line. Okay. This is a different ownership, and it won't, it is. from a legal standpoint, it won't have anything to do with Dunstan Crossing. This will be, hopefully, if Angela is nice, will be a public way someday. <laughs> that, I was just going to ask that. Is that going to be town maintained, or will that be privately maintained? This will be, a, this will be designed as a publicly accepted road. And we've already had discussions with uh, Angela, the fire department, and public okay. works about with this on-street parking, how that would work, where the property line would be, where the right-of-way would be, and uh, Jay also, we I think we're all under the same verbal agreement, okay. and now Jay is, we're slowly putting together uh, what that would look like in, in writing. So you're telling me then that this is this is not part of, this is not like, say, phase five mm -hmm. of Dunstan Crossing? No, no, okay. this is a project on its own. So I was looking at the master plan, and the master plan does talk about, um, Drainage. Um, can you talk to me about where the wet ponds are? So, what happens is there'll be when you pull into Dunson Crossing, mm -hmm. there's a large what's going to be a, a play field or an open space field right okay. here. Yep. Right after that will be a community center. Okay. In between the field and the community center will be one of the ponds that some of this drainage will go to. Uh, there's also a pond. You'll see this just the start of a, a property line. Um, actually, this is a neighbor's property line. This is be an interior line. There'll be another pond right here okay. that a, most of this drainage will go to. So it's off-site. The wet ponds are off-site. Yes. Have you thought about doing any localized stormwater treatment or stormwater attenuation, filtration? Yeah, we have um, actually working with Angela and right. DEP. Um, she might actually be able to explain it better than me. We're actually taking the roof water and doing drains and... Yep. Do you want me to? Yes. <laughs> um, there was concerns um, by DEP brought up about chlorides. And oh. so one of the things that I was talking with um, Sean Frank and Elliot about was maybe treating the roof runoff differently um, and infiltrating that rather than infiltrating uh -huh. a lot of sand and salt from the parking lot. The salt getting into the groundwater nice. was a concern. So I've been working with them trying to figure out a way, and it sounds like Sean might be there to, um, to take and treat the roots differently. Uh -huh. So you're still going to rely on the wet pond as like a velocity or a volume control measure? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, so that answered my question about um, complying with, you know, basically uh, making sure that there's no water quality impacts. Well, water quality of receiving waters shall not be degraded. But I'm looking at something separate. But this is, this is all helpful. I'm almost there. Um, I'm thinking out loud. Are, we're talking a little bit, too, about some buffer areas in the master plan um, and will be created using berms. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Well, I know Tom talked a little bit about uh, possibly some berms here. We do have yep. a situation in this design where the parking uh, is probably a little bit closer to Route 1 than maybe we would have loved. So with the possibility of uh, berms in combination with landscaping and trees, mm -hmm. uh, buffering that uh, mm -hmm. row of parking as much as possible. Uh, the two spots that we uh, need to be, actually three spots we need to be looked at from a setback point of view, um, actually I think it is two. We have one on the south side. This parking lot is less than 25 feet to the, to the line. Mm -hmm. You do have a pretty good elevation change from what our finished elevation of the parking lot will be to the elevation of the surrounding land is going to be in the six to eight foot range. So the backyard of this person, which is the first person on the right on Queens Drive, um, their back property line will be about six to eight feet above the elevation of our property. Uh, there is a pretty good standing of uh, large pine here now, um, but certainly if, if the planning board feels that even though we're much lower than this elevation, we still need a section of fence or 
some different type of screening, we're certainly willing to look at that. Yeah, six to eight feet, that's a, that's a pretty significant elevation difference. Yes. So, you know, from a public safety standpoint, it seems like it might be needed. I mean, what kind of slope are we talking about here? That'd be a three to one, two to one. That's yeah. pretty steep. <laughs> so I think for public safety, we might want to think of um, some type of fence. Right. Now, I think, Jay, what the zone changes as we go down this property line. You've got the furniture store right here, and right behind the furniture store, the zone actually changes. I think right about where your finger, yeah, right, in that right area. Yep. Yeah. In front of that, it, this setback on this parking lot is not an issue, correct? Not in terms of what the zoning requires. Okay. Would typically because require of the zone over here. Correct. Okay. So, but because this zone is different. Because that's, that's a residential right. zone, okay. what the TVC typically seeks, again, typically, mm -hmm. is a 25 foot setback that meets our Section 8 buffer standards, which essentially says if you have existing vegetation, that should remain. If there isn't any, then you should add some, more or less. But again, I, I did preface that by saying this isn't a planned development. And that is one of the standards that the planning board does have discretion mm -hmm. with in terms of so you can reduce that down 25 feet so long as you sort of look at the standards of the TBC. Make some type of compromise with Make, respect right. to Right. So, okay. so in the, the sort of the last section of the, plan, of the TBC district talks about the plan development standards and what the board needs to find to enable flexible um, setbacks. So, for example, I think as part of the master plan process, the board said, yeah, we're generally comfortable with the building, the front yards being down to, you know, almost three or four or five feet, you know, six, you know, whatever, whatever that winds up being to the yeah. internal roads. Yeah. But um, so th those are the type of things that yeah. the board will ultimately, as part of the, as Elliot sort of expressed, there will be a subdivision plan that comes mm -hmm. in. And, and I think that's where the board will need to codify sort of what these setbacks are going to be. Yeah. And then the, the other location is on the north side of the property yep. with the, th the parking lot for the three unit building and the three unit building itself. You can see the dock line uh, that Tom has put on here showing the setback line and you can see that we're over it. Um, mm -hmm. So that would certainly Tell me be about the grade on that side if you wouldn't mind. Uh, like over here I believe the grade once we do our regrading um, and I think neighbors here tonight um, I think that we're not going to have the situation we okay. do over here. Certainly not eight feet. I yep. think we're going to be much closer. I don't know if I dare say flush, but I think we're going to be, you know, more in that two foot, two yep. foot range of, of difference. But I can, we certainly can look at the existing grades and what we're going to have for a proposed grade and give you an exact difference. Yeah. Are there yeah. any, are there any natural sort of swales or drainage areas on this property? No, basically what happens when you come off Route 1, yep. the, the vast majority of the property where the house used to sit years ago, this is a little flatter okay. um, and then drops down. This, what happens, there used to be an old uh, gravel pit back in the 40s when the turnpike got built. Yep. This was one of the gravel pits they used. Um, so the good part is we have pretty good soils out here. Okay. Um, this side of the property tends to flare up about five feet and then slowly drop down and then drop quick into the old pit. What we're looking at by the time we're done is a 1% uh, increase. So you're going to rise about two feet to the center and then two feet back down. So when you get yeah. to the back of the project, you're going to be at the same elevation as when you entered the project. Do you have a feel for, um, I know you're talking a little bit about the subsurface and it being fairly gravel, like a sand and gravel yep. type situation. Do you have a feel for where the groundwater table is? Are we talking about um, potentially um, no no flooding, you're not in flood zones oh or God, anything no. like that. Anyway. Just to give you a quick idea, we're at, when you enter the project, we're at, at about elevation 76. Okay. The lowest point in what was the old pit was, is elevation about 50. Okay. And we, one of the things we always laugh about is that when you pull in there, we've used it as a storage yard for a while. Um, after very, very heavy rainstorms, there's never a drop of water. I mean, that, that site drains for it. We've never had groundwater even, and even you're not at on the a bottom of the pit. You're not on a map sand and gravel aquifer, or are you? Nope. Okay. Not that we know. You're in Scarborough. Well, yeah. <laughs> and there's no vernal pools either. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that would be my concern is, you know, I'm kind of envisioning, though, too, on this left-hand side here, maybe even, you know, if, if you're not crazy about a fence or something like that, maybe even terrace you know, landscaping or something like that, you know, like, um, 
you know, a couple a couple terraces. Yeah, and it is, just to give you an idea, because of the zone, this one's not an issue because of the different zone, this one is. It's for about a about eight parking spots long that okay. before we get back to meeting that 25-foot okay. setback. And I just think that berms are ugly, so, yeah. like, <laughs> so if you can try to avoid those. Um, so let's see. Um, I had a couple other comments. Um, so you kind of answered it already. Will any plantings be recessed kind of a thing? So instead of having, you know, a parking lot um, landscaping be curbed, we're, we're moving away from that. We don't want to incorporate that, Angela, is what I'm hearing because of chloride impacts kind of a thing. Well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? You're talking about mini, like mini like ponds? Mini, mini islands or mini like infiltration sort of like uh, tree box filter type thing. Oh, okay. Well, it, I haven't seen, they're still working on the plans and what he's going to propose to Not do it. with the roof runoff at this point, so okay. I don't know what. We actually on. plan to infiltrate the roof runoff right into the <laughs> ground because of the soils we have. But she's asking for, is it a low-lying area like for landscaping might yeah. be, like a, a bioretention kind of cell or? Yeah. Right, I, I believe Sean plans on infiltrating right underground. Um, Okay, but in the but parking I'll, but I'll lot, him, I will so let him give we'll into that. that. But no, we <laughs> don't. At this point, I don't believe Sean has any infiltration ponds designed anywhere. And well, I, not I an will infiltration pond, but like little islands in where the parking lot is. No, and I will tell you, in reality, you don't like it. Be blunt, they suck. Yeah, they, for they, snow they, removal purposes. For a lot of reasons, they they never get cleaned out the way they're supposed to. The filter, a filter is a filter. Well, if you have a maintenance plan. <laughs> Let's be realistic. You know, <laughs> no, you can, I am. You can have the best plan written up. The yeah. question is, you change owners, you change uh, maintenance crews, you change yep. management. Um, <clears throat> th they don't get done and kept up the way they should be. They clog much quicker, I find, in reality, than what anybody says that before they do. I find the wet ponds work extremely well. If you treat ponds, especially if they're out in the open like we did at Dunson, and turn what is a lot of times is an ugly negative into what can be a very architecturally pleasing site. That's really good feedback, and I would encourage you to be part of the, the watershed management planning process Great. that's going I on there. I myself into that one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, bravo. So let's talk, just, just remind me, the wet pond is off-site, but you'll have some type of agreement coordinated with the Dunstan Crossing yes. property. Uh, right. Th granted, this is a little different ownership. I do control both sides. Yeah. Um, so yes, there will be legal uh, okay. documents in place for them to have that pond and be able to use that pond uh, forever. Okay, and you talked a little bit about your timeline. You like, you'd like to have people go into the restaurant by April or May next year? Uh, probably, the restaurant probably realistically sometime in June. Okay. Um, I would think we'd probably, if everything goes the way I think, probably have residents in the townhomes probably in, in May. Okay. I mean, we we'd have to wait until around the last two weeks of April when the pavement plans typically open back up anyways. Okay. So you're not going to see any pavement. But you're talking about winter year. construction. Oh yes, all okay. winter. All winter right. So just remember winter construction has different implications with respect to erosion sedimentation control, but <laughs> Angela has that all taken care of there. Um, so <laughs> um, I guess we're, what I'd like to end with is just sort of summarizing what I'm hearing here. I'm hearing mm -hmm. that we may need some type of fence or, or buffer over on the left hand side. Yep. You have a lot of utility coordination to do and some legal sort of coordination with respect to the wet pond so that you can have all of your drainage report there. You're working with Angela on some of the, the localized infiltration if if anything. Yes. Uh, kind of thing, what we can do there. And um, I I'd also like to speak if if I could to um, the hemlocks. I I, I would strongly encourage you to go away from hemlocks. Right. And I'm, the woolly adelgia is. And I, don't, I completely agree with you. And I, the other thing that we've run into this year, after the bottom fell out in 08, yep. what happened is you found a lot of places around the country just stopped growing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The inventory problem that a lot of people are having is, is a much bigger problem than people realize. A lot of species we just can't get. We can't get the size we want. Yep. can't get the quantities we want. Yep. So we're not only trying to live by an ordinance, we're trying to live by something that's going to stay healthy and yep. fit the 
project right, and we can get it. Yes. No, and I, and I see that, but in, and I get also what Tom was talking about as far as, um, you know, you're going to choose your nursery very well, but it's also a, a matter of if you build it, they will come. And the more hemlocks that you have, it will, you know, even though it's not on your property, it may be drawn in from other properties kind of a thing. Right? I know, exactly. I don't give up on any I know. Remember, I remember that. Yeah. Yep. Excuse me, we're not right. supposed to be doing that. And last, I'd just <laughs> like to say, Elliot, you're going to join the watershed management planning process? <laughs> yeah, I'll take on that one. Oh, please? Okay, thank you. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Susan. And you think I know about landscaping. <laughs> <laughs> really? Can you me? <laughs> what you know about oh, water is compared to what I know about landscaping is nothing. By the way, my house is surrounded by hemlock. It all is grown locally. It comes from Maine. They've been there for 25 years. They're healthy as all get out. And if they're not, I'll cut them down. Anyway, moving right along, I love hemlock. I think you're doing an amazing job. I really do. I mean, I've been here from the beginning, and it's just working exactly the way you said it was going to work. A little slower, but yes. Yeah, well, pretty close to what we yeah, said. but the quality hasn't suffered at all. None of it has. If you haven't <coughs> been through the the, the, um, the residential part, oh, you must. I will. It is really. We're proud to have it. Um, quick question on the restaurant: the fake windows. Hate that word. The windows that are not really windows on the second story where there's not going to be anything. Would you on the restaurant? Yeah. Fall stormers. Fall stormers. Thanks. Well, well yeah. they. I mean, I just want to make sure that the windows themselves are going to look like, win do, don't make it. No, like they're not fake windows. Oh, thank if, God. If we do those, these mm -hmm. dormants, they're actually real windows. All we do is we, they're either going to shine through to the first floor. Now, this one's over the kitchen, actually over the bathrooms. So that one probably won't be. Uh, typically, what we do is just blacken out the back side. We might put a sheet of plywood and blacken it out, but it's a real window. No, that's not my point. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not asking it very well. If you go to what I call the prison, Okay, that's better known as Walgreens. Sorry, but I say what I think. <laughs> Those windows that are not really, you know, you know, you look at them and I don't know what no, they that, are. No, that is absolutely correct. That, that will absolutely not, not happen. Intention. I have your word have, on that. You have my word Thank on that. You we very would never much. do that. That was outrageous. We would never do that. Okay, um, I want to ag agree with um, Angela about the um, where you don't have the 25 foot setback. You know, I mean, no, she was talking about the difference in height. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, up in there. Yeah, my only condition, would, my only concern would be safety. I think it's a very good point, so I just want to put a check mark next to that, okay. too. Um, I don't really have a lot to say. I happen to like berms if they're well landscaped, and I think the idea of the berm on Route 1 is a great idea. Just, only if you come to the... You need to come up if you want to say anything else. Thank you. I became a landscape architect because, first and foremost, I wanted to be a golf course architect. I see. And, <laughs> okay. Uh, if you look at the, the natural golf courses, you know, the ones that were the Lynx courses in Scotland and Ireland. Oh, I've been there those, last week. Those so. land, those, some are very abrupt, but oftentimes they just flow. And, and what people do with berms, I don't know who ever taught people to do, put a front yard garden like this, but three truckloads of loam <laughs> delivered, and they dump the loam, and whatever the natural repose of the soil is, that's the way it stands, and they put trees in the middle on top and then shrubs in the face on each side. A well-landscaped berm should be such that you don't really understand it's a berm. It flows, right. and it's mixed with other berms coming from other directions. So that's what we'd like to achieve with a berm. The advantage of a berm is it gets the plant material up so that the, the, uh, it, it blocks, the, the, it provides a nice solid, mixed uh, solid uh, view to the uh, cars, but allows the clearing, you know, the uh, house line of the trees so you can see under the trees to the to the houses and the activity uh, beyond. I think it's a grand idea. And anyway, and the apartments where the uh, ends have no windows, I think it's a brilliant concept. I, I see vines. You know, um, um, what is it blooms this time of year? Um, come on, help me. Boston Ivy. No, not no. Anyway, never mind. I'll give you a call someday, but, you know, <laughs> some kind of perennial vine, 
would be, you know, with, with some, with some um, architectural details, I think it would look lovely. And it's a great idea to have that privacy, whatever. Um, I, I do think there's going to be a question about the mechanical pads when you come back, but that'll be with Sean, right? I mean, where all that stuff is going. You haven't got to go over it again. Well, you, right. We we did we did show the mechanical pads, but believe me, I I don't think there's anybody in this room that wants those hidden uh, more than me. No, I don't either. But I mean, it is one of those things that is nobody wants to talk about. So I'm just more, just saying yep. that you know we'll we'll be looking, and I know that you can do it. Um, and I really love the landscaping. I really am the landscape lady, and I don't get to see something like this very often. So it's a treat and a half for me to have you here and what I know you're going to be doing. Um, I don't have any other questions. I just think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? Thank you. Um, as far as the landscaping goes, I think it's, you've done a nice job from, as far as what I can tell and the type of trees you select, I'm sure, will be fantastic. So, um, as far as the setbacks, is that the one area, the only area on that property you have an issue with setbacks? Is there, are there any? No, there's two. There's this one, um, which is a combination of a setback issue and, and a, a quick elevation change. And then there's this one on the north side with the building and this piece. Um, Jay, is it the same issue with the parking or not? Phil, it's a building setback, so the parking can be closer. Okay. So and because that's a commercial zone to the, the right there. There is also, and I don't know if maybe this is what you're getting to, which I don't know that we've really discussed specifically, is the 15-foot streetscape uh, buffer. It's a little bit of everything, yeah. yeah but which it's been talked about indirectly, I think. But right. I don't know if that was what you're thinking of. Yeah. Right. I, you're talking about this area here. Well, right. well yeah. yeah one. So, so the other, back to the other spot. Uh, this is a spot with a setback. This building does go into the setback. Just the top corner? Uh, yeah, you'll see the dark line. So we just touch it on the bottom end of the building, and it gets greater as you get to the back of the building. The impact becomes greater. Okay, so even the bottom is is not. Yes, the bottom is just touching it. Okay. And then as as far as the streetscape setbacks, what is your width over there currently? Twelve you know, roughly. Twenty-five feet. It's, it's 25 feet currently? From the right-of-way line to the edge of the parking lot. Okay. And what's the 15-foot uh, setbacks that we were referencing? Where are those areas? Um, so the TVC has a 15-foot streetscape buffer that's required along Route 1. I think they, I measured that out. I'm pretty sure they exceed that. Um, I'm pretty sure they exceed that okay. requirement. And, and then, um, the question became really more about just ensuring what, what the standard talks about is where there's parking between the, the road and the building, ensuring, as I think with, uh, Mr. Emery was just describing, that there is some type of visual break so that the, the, you, you can still see the buildings, but the cars aren't a prominent feature. And so I think what right. Mr. Emery was describing mm -hmm. is really the, the intent of the design standards okay. and the landscape ordinance. So I okay. think when we see those details. And, okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I, I mean, it, it sounds to me like you know you have eight spots over there, and it sounds kind of a minimal, uh, the minimal viol—I won't call it a violation, but a um, issue with the setback line, right? It's, it's, I, yeah, and, and just to give you a, a, just a kind of a quick mental picture, is, um, we're probably from from our corner of the property across the uh, what is the furniture store and I, I, don't, I think it's a comic book store, I'm not sure what it is. You have the entrance to Queens Drive, which runs parallel to our property right here. So you've got one residence, and I'm not trying to minimize anything, but you have one residence that abuts our back corner. Um, so they're, obviously their house is close to uh, Queens Drive, and they have uh, a grouping of large-scale pines at the back of their property. And, and as in fairness, as Jay said, that person at some point could wipe all that clean, and we are going under the 25-foot setback. Uh, you know, so it's a case of trying to find the proper screening and dealing with the the elevation change all at the same time. Yeah, and, and I think you can successfully do it. I, as a general rule of thumb, and I'll just state this 
so you have some idea of why I'm circling this question and all the others. You, you've essentially started with a blank canvas here, and, and you're aware of where your setbacks are, and you fill it in. You're filling it in as you kind of see the project develop, and you're over here, a little splash over there. You're not coloring fully inside the lines, but it still looks like a nice picture, right? And I get it. That's going to happen when you're moving things around. But to have a whole building you know, on the right side here, of your of your your design, the building being virtually over your setbacks. Yep. Why? And I expected I expected um, a very good reason as to why it couldn't. You had a blank canvas and you couldn't fit it in the way it was proposed. And I, I get it. Things happen. Maybe the the uh, landscape there is a little tough to work around. There's some ledge. Who knows? But I like to hear you know the reason why we, we're not coloring in the well, lines. Well, I'm, I'm not saying it's a great one, but basically the. The, the road layout, there is, there's been many, many versions of what this eight acres looks like. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we came back to putting the road where it was drawn 10, 15 years ago. Um, so that ended up becoming a fixed point. Obviously, the property line to the north is a fixed point, and the 25-foot setback is a fixed point. We have a roadway width to work with, a proper sidewalk. We were trying to incorporate some outdoor activity that might happen there, whether it's eating or outdoor sales or uh, sitting having a cup of coffee. We have to deal with certain wind, uh, building depths that some you go too, uh, too shallow, they just become unleasable. Obviously, the roadway in the back, you're dealing with minimums. The buildings we had became minimums. Um, you're right. Could this building change? There is, there's a possibility of that. Um, by the time we got done fitting all of, of, all of our parameters and what we were looking for and trying to accomplish in the mixture, it, it's kind of where it ended up. Um, and you're right, that's not a great reason. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, we'd have to shrink that building a decent amount to, uh, to bring it back within that 25 foot. I, you know, I was kind of probably more looking with, in the sense of, I'm glad you explained to me. You know, I, I get the roads a fixed point, and and then you're moving with, you know, roadway widths, and then other things. I I understand that. I I get it. You know, but I look at this, and there's some green space here, and some other things which are beautiful. And um, the thing is, is you do have neighbors, and we have the setbacks for a reason, and 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 that's why I wanted to know more about why we're splashing over those lines, but. You know, in the scheme of things, I'm looking at this entire project and everything that's in front of me, and it's a beautiful project, and we're all very excited for it. But I think we need to be mindful of those little things once in a while. So that said, just for a point of clarity, if I could, I just want to be clear. So you you referenced a 25 foot setback. I think you were talking to the property to the to the right to the north. That's a 15 foot setback. 15. I'm sorry. So I could you just tell us what is the setback that you, line you think you're going to be on or how far set back from the property do you think you will be? Uh, we're is it for five feet, you've got two feet, just rough. Setback currently is drawn at 50. Because like the setback line wasn't shown on the plan that was no, this submitted. Line here is just barely over. I believe we're 15 mm -hmm. at the corner, but we'll double check that. So if you're at 15 at the corner, you're going to be meeting our standard. That's correct. Okay. So the only issue would be this top corner, if any at all not the entire building, correct? And I guess the reason I wanted to bring this up is, as you alluded to, I know um, your, your engineer's working on your subdivision submission, it's, and I, I referenced it earlier, that the subdivision is going to be the critical moment when the board sets the setbacks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if it's going to be 15 on that, so I think that's where you need, we, we sort of need to have that understanding. If it's going to be reduced below 15, that's where they'll need to be, as uh, Mr. McGee was just asking for, sort of that evidence of why, why it should be 12, 13, or 2, whatever the case may be. Same, same scenario for the parking area, just the discussion for the board so that when on the subdivision plan, it'll be clear what the board's approving for setbacks because that's what the TVC allows for is that flexibility <coughs> for, so. Well, you're yep. in a moment of clarity. <laughs> I don't know if it's clarity or not, but. Uh, you, you had mentioned the, it's the parking lot can go below the setback, has a lesser setback. Right, we do. Why, and why are we at an issue here? Because, again, that's because it's, 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 it's abutting a, a okay. residential zone. And so the standard's different when you're abutting a residential zone. That's, so, 
we can go through the space and bulk standards yep. offline if you'd like. Or Does he have to pull out tonight, the book again? <laughs> What's that? Are you going to pull out the book no. again? <laughs> it was <laughs> sitting on it. Out. It was well done. We're already in danger of turning into a workshop. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I just uh, a quick question. I. Um, I, you'll just refresh me because I know we've looked at this before. The parking uh, spaces, the number of parking spaces is adequate for what you're proposing here? Yeah, we actually took a, a worst case scenario point of view where we said let's, let's look at what the town standards are for a type of use, what they require for square footage or number of tenants um, and require those. Um, I've, I've had some conversations with Jay and Dan about utilizing shared parking counts. Um, and that's always that's always a gray area because it's, we certainly have some daytime uses and we're going to have some uh, more nighttime uses with the residents. Um, the question is how much of those, uh, you know, is it 10%, 20% can we knock off? We didn't take any off. We took worst case scenario and said can we make it work under the current uses and we actually have a few spaces extra at this point. Great, thank you. And then um, as far as the restaurant and perhaps Jay could help me out on this one. Is it, it is possible for them to go through a process to get a zoning variance, correct, through the zoning board? Uh, I guess I would have to talk with our zoning administrator if that's something that you could get a variance on. Right. Um, I think it's worthwhile to investigate the process. I personally agree with you. It's, it's a little bit of an arbitrary number in a situation like this for a building height of... Oh, don't worry, I'm already there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's my first phone call tomorrow morning. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, it's arbitrary to some extent, but I think it's also worth investigating whether or not there's a process that would make this easier on, on everyone. Um, right. I mean, I look at it as, a, as, and I got talked about in detail in the, last, in the last week or so, but I look at it as an arbitrary uh, uh, ordinance that it's, it was somebody's opinion that thought that looks better and that has more appeal in a village setting than a one-story building that has, you know, we have 10-foot tall walls now, and we're not coming close. You know, we're five feet short. Um, and we think it fits in extremely nicely into the mixture of styles and buildings and uses that we have. Uh, worst case scenario, everyone loves the cathedral ceiling, so. Okay. We An open air one. feel. <laughs> it's going to get a lot bigger, maybe. Right. Um, and then I think I have here for... My pen went ran out of ink, so I'm going to read the scratching in the uh, in the paper now. <laughs> um, oh, the uh, the building, the the large one to the right. Yep. I was just looking at the uh, drawings here, and if I could pull it up, I believe it was like A201 I had in my packet. Yeah. There we go. It's, uh, I'm referencing the architectural styles here, and the question is more general. This little uh, utility garage <coughs> in this pass-through area. Could you talk me through the designing of this gorgeous building, and then the apparent afterthought of a utility shed here? There it is. Okay. <laughs> the um, wonderful trash. How do okay. we deal with it? What do we do with it? Um, do we have curbside pickup? Do we have so that that's uh, one of the struggles in a project like this? I hate visual dumpsters, open dumpsters, mm -hmm. especially ones that don't have covers. Um, we don't live that very far from the ocean. Seagulls are a problem. Um, they like to drag it all over uh, the neighborhood. So one of the ways to deal with that was to build a building and actually have the dumpsters inside that garage. In that particular one, we need to design the door at a 14 by 14 so the physical truck by the trash company can actually pull just into the building, pick the dumpster up, back out, dump it, bring it down, pull back in and put it down. And we'd have, in this case, probably like one 8 to 10 yard trash and one 8 yard recycling type of thing. What we plan to do is have um, these are probably going to be different owners. One person is going to own the, the four three-unit buildings. One person is going to own the 34-unit building. We intend to share the, the trash services uh, through that garage. Um, it, it, it's a balancing act between designing an efficient apartment, not having excess space, still providing what you need, 
one of the things that's always tough is having trash sit inside a unit, uh, a good place for it, and there's never a good place in trying to design a, a, an efficient apartment. So it's a case where the residents could bring trash bags over to that garage, walk in, place their trash in a dumpster seven days a week if they wanted to. Okay. I think that's all for my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Well, as is often the case with these things, all the good stuff's already been taken. <laughs> um, and I won't, I won't belabor the points by, re by repeating them, at least all of them. But um, this is obviously, I, I hopefully for your purposes, been some good feedback um, and some good food for thought and some, a lot of good points have been raised. Um, in terms of the, and I'll just touch on, on two or three of these. Um, it sounds like we're definitely well on the way in terms of landscaping. I agree that um, it sounds like uh, it'll be a nice plan. It's been uh, very thoughtfully prepared, and um, you obviously have, as you said, every reason to uh, make sure these things are done right. And, and you know, one advantage we have in a situation like this is that although this is a project unto itself, we know that you know, we've, we have evidence of, of uh, what you've done right next door, and and the, the level of uh, level of quality and 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 design there, and we know that you want to protect that investment. So I'm sure that I'm sure it'll turn out great. Um, in terms of the height of the um, of the restaurant, I completely agree and, and sympathize to to a degree uh, about the the arbitrary nature of that number. The fact is that every number in our ordinances are going to be arbitrary at some point because there has to be a number. There has to be some kind of cutoff. Um, and I wasn't part of that process, but I know that having been involved in some other ones, uh, I'm sure that there was a lot of discussion and thought. Um, and hopefully you can come up, you can come up with something that, um, whether it's pursuing some sort of uh, relief, if that's an option, a viable option, or Working with the uh, design and coming up with a you know a, a height, an average height or 50% um, that of the height that uh, meets that requirement. I'm sure that you'll come up with something. Um, uh, as Ms. Auglis said, I, I know we're, we're both on the same page on the you know false windows. So I'm glad to hear that they're they're not they're not just fake um, kind of Disney windows that you're Disney. that you're contemplating. Um, we, won't, we won't have a prison in South right. Chicago. Thank you. But I do think if you can if you can find a way to to, to meet that, um, I, I think based on based on the, the rendering that we've seen here, that um, you're on the right right track in terms of having um, enough kind of vertical architectural interest that it'll have that presence that I think was really the intent. Um, so I think you're you're on the right track there, and I'm sure you'll come up with something. Um, as always, look forward to seeing more details on, on the lighting and the mechanicals. Um, sounds like there are a couple of things to maybe discuss with staff on lighting, including the LED fixtures that you mentioned. Correct. Um, and I uh, just want to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've covered buffers pretty thoroughly, and uh, I think you've got a pretty good, pretty good list of homework. To do yeah, and look and forward and to seeing the next uh, iteration. Since you brought up the lighting, you know, it, you know, I mentioned legally these are separate projects. Realistically, nobody in the world driving in is going to think right. they're just blended together. So, the, you know, the continuous feel throughout, whether you're coming from Broad Turn back to Route One, or whether you're coming from Route One down into the neighborhood, um, the lighting we planned, you know, all the same lights, uh, same styles, visual presence. Uh, we plan to use right up through the neighborhood. Um, I don't want you to feel as you drive in, oh, I've, I've gone into another place now. I want it to feel like it just all blends and, uh, and it's all one neighborhood. Will the signage be a similar style in terms of the, the sort of the branding and the look? Yes. Um, yep. It's just more out of curiosity than yes. anything else? Okay. Absolutely. And also in terms of, it sort of reminded me of the, um, you know, the, the blank side elevation of those buildings, particularly facing Route 1. Um, and I guess I, I agree with, with Susan that there should be some, some way to 
um, short of fenestration or other penetrations to come up with some architectural interest there um, to to address that concern. And I, I completely understand where you're coming from on it from a from a design and functionality perspective. Uh, but particularly those elevations that do face Route 1, those will be, even with some landscaping and berming, those will be visible to an extent. Um, so just want to make sure that's that's on the radar and some thoughts yep. given to that. And it's, it clearly is on your radar now. So um, beyond that, I think we've covered it pretty well, and hopefully we'll see you back fairly soon. And is, is there anything else you need from us at this point? Comes of feedback? No, I think right. we're good. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Good luck. All right. Do we have a town planner's report? Um, let's see, what do I have jotted down here? Yes, uh, so next Monday um, there's discussion. Um, we're having a discussion at 7 o'clock, but then there's also an opportunity to get together with our transportation committee mm -hmm. following uh, our, our agenda item. Um, and to talk about to do this complete streets policy presentation and have a general conversation with the transportation committee folks and we thought that might be a good opportunity to get the two boards together so looking for board members to give us an indication if they're available to stick around I'm seeing one head two head three head four good Shrug, shrug, I'll take it as a yes. So. <laughs> All right, great. We will plan on doing that. We'll coordinate that and we'll send around more information as we get closer. But great, thank you. Um, don't know that I have anything else to report. Angela, you have? Can I add something? <laughs> Please do. Please do. Um, the beginning of October, October 5th, right, where I've plotted it right now, um, I'm going to be taking the streets that are in Settlers Green 2 to Council for acceptance. And that is um, Farmhouse Road, Weather Rainway, and Red Barn Circle. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys the closure on that, I guess. Um, Settlers Green, too. So that's exciting. Uh, we're this close. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the update. Uh, administrative amendment report. Nothing to report. Planning Board correspondence. Uh, everyone on the board, I believe, did receive a copy of an email from Peter and Shirley Liakos, um, dated August 31st, uh, in support of the proposed uh, conversion of the Conroy's Garage on Grand Avenue, East Grand Avenue, into a restaurant. Um, is there any other Planning Board correspondence? Um, I'll just, on, on that, we have received a few other emails that I've been sort of Okay. storing those for when the application comes before you so we'll okay. we'll make those available to you when when that comes forward so just so other folks know if they no. um, those will be provided to you at the at that time and then you should also I think if not we'll have it for you next Monday uh, the highest Parkway amendments that were before you a meeting or three ago um, as a public hearing had gone back to council and they adopted those changes um, and so um, you now that our ordinance is all in nice little chapters, you can pull out your old Haggis <laughs> Parkway and put in the put new Haggis Parkway Park pages. They, um, they did get those. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I just wanted to make sure. Yep. Um, planning board comments, Susan. I think that it was a very interesting evening, to say the least, tonight. And um, I think the um, Dunstan Crossing and is a perfect example of how when you start in advance working on something um, in an organized fashion and keep up with the, you know, the, the uh, applicant comes in regularly, we see it regularly. It's just, a, it's just the way it should be done. And this was a classic example of how it can work and work well. I mean, it's going to be great when it's done, but I think we deserve a lot of credit too for getting right in there and insisting that we see all the details. And I'm very excited about it and I'm proud of us. Thank you. Robin? A comment, I, wanna, I wanted to apologize for not being able to make it to the site walk today at 25 Plaza Drive, and I also wanted to just, um, whenever that, that project does come in front of us, um, I'd like to just mention that the really, the, Dan sent out a really lengthy email about 25 Plaza Drive, and I would just wanna encourage 
staff, Jay, or you or whoever, to just include that email in that project when it comes up in front of us because there was stuff in there that I wanted to just remember <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, and I'd like to catch up with a couple of you just on, to get feedback on the site walk if, if you wouldn't mind. So thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a good idea to kind of keep that firm because there was a lot of good stuff in there mm -hmm. in terms of context and big picture goals. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, yeah. on the site walk, uh, I want to thank uh, staff and, and uh, the property owner for helping <coughs> to coordinate that. And it was helpful and we definitely fill you in offline and um, look forward to kind of seeing that take shape. Um, Jay alluded to uh, the meeting that we do have here next Monday. It's a special meeting of the planning board. Um, we will be, it uh, sounds like, talking about complete streets, the complete streets initiative, but the original impetus for that meeting was to um, consider an amended site plan um, request from Avesta Housing and um, it was the opinion of town staff, and I think the board agrees that it is, uh, you know, somewhat somewhat extraordinary for us to have a special meeting. But under the circumstances, uh, given the fact that there is a um, an affordable main main state housing financing application deadline in early October, and this is a potentially important affordable housing uh, project for the town, so I thank uh, my fellow board members for being willing to to come in out of cycle and spend another Monday night <laughs> here doing that. Um, and uh, that's all I have. Anyone else? With that, I would move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you. <coughs> Anybody on a Honda?